I'm Andrew Schwartz, and you're listening to The Truth of the Matter, a podcast by CSIS where we break down the top policy issues of the day and talk with the people that can help us best understand what's really going on. To get to the truth of the matter about what's going on with our data, about TikTok, about the internet, we have with us Frank McCourt, who's the chairman of McCourt Global, founder of Project Liberty. Many of our listeners will know him as the former owner of the Los Angeles Dodgers, but he has a terrific book out called Our Biggest Fight, Reclaiming Liberty, Humanity, and Dignity in the Digital Age. And I want to hear from Frank today all about Project Liberty and what that's all about. So Frank, welcome to the podcast, and thanks so much for sharing some of your thoughts with us. Yeah, it's great to be here with you and happy to answer all your questions. So tell me about why you founded Project Liberty, what it is, and what it's focused on. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, I came out of those, uh, that Los Angeles experience and and moved back east and was well aware by that time of the shift and the change in internet technology and how a decentralized internet had become very centralized and very app driven. And there was a race to collect our data and and big platforms were using it in, in ways that they determined you know, they should use it. It wasn't something that was coming from, you know, better policy objectives or and so on and so forth. So I helped start a public policy school here in DC with Georgetown and uh, located here on Capitol Hill to address some of these public policy this issues. This is the McCourt School of Public Policy at Georgetown University. Yeah, th- that's correct. And that was, uh, we founded that in uh, to th- October of 2013. Embedded within was a massive data institute or is a massive data institute. And we went to work to, you know, understanding that, you know, data is very important. Big data can provide a lot of insight. And let's see if we can get the policy making apparatus to get out ahead of where big tech was going. And when I say where they were going, big tech was extracting our data, aggregating it and applying machine learning, i.e. algorithms to it. And it was having profound effects on uh, society and our civil discourse and uh, our policymaking apparatus and our just ability to be governed, right? Because these platforms, you know, when you connect hundreds of millions of people and have very few rules or regulations, then suddenly um, you're back into the wild west. And so thought, Let's let's start addressing this in a very very you know from a from a place of values which Georgetown clearly possesses to see if we could you know create a, a new way of thinking about the future and our digital future in a way that respected our our rights our human rights our civil rights and so forth and and uh, and start asking the question what do we want to really optimize for what do we want to use this tech for for what end and I discovered rather quickly that the the policy making apparatus which is deliberative by design uh takes time for good policy to evolve and 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 be created was no match quite frankly for the speed the power the wealth the reach uh the advocacy of big tech and when i say big tech i'm talking about internet technology here i'm not <laughs> i'm pro tech i'm sure. pro internet and there's a lot of good things that technology does. But the internet specifically has been colonized by a few companies and they're deciding what to do with our data. And it's having profound impacts on society and on our democracy and particularly on young children. And so in uh, December of 2019, launched Project Liberty internally, which was a project to address the actual infrastructure of the internet and from the ground up, not from the app level, i.e. top down. And the idea was to reset the internet so that we as individuals would own, control our identity and our data and permission its use, rather than you know, giving up everything about us to these platforms. What? To be able to have a free app? It made no sense to me. And so that's what Project Liberty is about. And we now have put forward the tech, released it to the world, The core protocol is open source, so now it's owned by everyone. And just like the prior core protocols that in one case connected devices, in another case connected data, imagine now we're connected, our social graph or personal information is part of the internet itself. It's not owned by any one company. It's owned by all of us, right? It's a resource, a utility that's for the good of the public. Yet we, each of us, 
own and control our own social graphs and permission its use. So that's the project. And of course, it's bigger than tech. We talk a lot about the tech because we know we need to fix this broken internet. But this time around, rather than leaving it just to technologists, let's engage the social scientists, the policymakers, you know, citizens, parents, et cetera, et cetera. So we're, we understand what we're optimizing for and then let the technologists go to work as opposed to letting the technologists move fast and break things. I've heard you use a very plain spoken um, analogy to the internet when you talk about the post office. Tell me what this analogy means to you because it really explains it in very you know plain terms. Yeah, well, I mean, you just all of these things, um, I think these issues which can become very complicated very quickly if you try to dive deep into it. I think I think it's a big mistake to do that. We because it's endless. You get an endless loop of technology and questions and science and conspiracy and totally, all of that. Totally. So it's important to, in an authentic way, uh, simplify things. And, and and metaphors are very often good at doing that. So the example I use is. Andrew, let's pretend I'm the head of the Postal Service. And I say to Americans, let's say, you know what? I have a deal for you. Uh, no more stamps. We're going to deliver your mail for free from now on. And you, you, you as a, you know, a citizen, as a user of the Postal Service say, okay, what's the deal? Well, I'm going to put a camera and a listening device in every room of your home, in your workplace, in your car. I'm going to essentially just track you 24 uh, seven. And, you and your family, uh, your kids. Everybody, of yeah. course, it's in the kids' bedrooms too, right? It's everywhere. And you'd say, well, that's super creepy. And I'd say, free, no more stamps. And I'd say, oh, one other thing. I'm going to open your mail. I'm going to read your mail. And now everything I learn about you is now mine. I own you. And, and remember, What's in that mail is not just where you shop or what you like to eat. It's your most, it's your ideas, your thoughts, your, your, your creativity. It's your emotion, your feelings, your most intimate feelings. And now this is all owned by someone else. This is who we are. And so you would say, not only is it creepy, it's unfair. And then I'd say, well, yeah, one other thing, I'm gonna read your 13 year old daughter's diary. And when I learn that she's a bit concerned about her weight, I'm going to push stuff on her to make her feel worse. Social media, emails, I'm all gonna kinds push of stuff. stuff on her to profit. And I'm gonna push stuff on her to show her how to hurt herself. So you'd say creepy, unfair, and super harmful. That's the internet technology we have right now. And it's just time to call it out and fix it. The good news is this doesn't have to be this way and it can be fixed. And that's what Project Liberty is about, putting forward a solution to this mess as opposed to just recycling, you know, throwing more logs on the fire of the problems. We're all seeing the harms now. And it's, you, you, you know, one's perspective may be, look at, our, look at our democracy, we're barely governable. Maybe we're not even governable anymore because we're super polarized, right? And that's also enabled by the very same technology and, and social media. That's clearly driving polarization. I, I teach a class at uh, University of Southern California in the Annenberg School that talks about how media polarization is driving our political polarization. So much of it comes from data and social media and the internet. Yeah, I mean, we, we have created a beautiful, you know, brilliant men and women created a, a beautiful piece of technology, the internet. And it's, it was intended to be a decentralized, empowering tool to make us smarter, to advance civilization, to be the proverbial tide that lifts all boats. And it's become something totally different. It's now become a weapon in many ways. It's so poorly designed for what it's doing that it amplifies bad behavior and overwhelms good. And so now we've handed a weapon to foreign adversaries who want to undermine democracy, who want to put our country in a state of chaos. Uh, because why? 
It's an ideological battle between freedom and liberty and democracy versus a different political order. You know, uh, in China, for example, wants to see its political order prevail uh, and over ours. And so this is a extremely important issue with geopolitical considerations, just day-to-day -day considerations in terms of our ability to have civil discourse and get along and have a peaceful Thanksgiving dinner. But perhaps most importantly, we're now seeing an epidemic with young people. And the fact that this has gotten to this point, that we now have to hear the testimonials from parents who have lost children to this broken internet, it shouldn't have taken this long for us to wake up. But thankfully, these parents heroically are stepping up in honor of their lost children saying, this internet is broken and it needs to be fixed. This is a fascinating discussion and I could talk to you about this all day, but I wanna zero in on something. You know, We're talking about working with policymakers, of course, when it comes to changing these policies. There was a, a pretty infamous hearing on Capitol Hill a few years back where senators were questioning some of the leaders of big tech and asking them things like, well, you know, how do I friend someone on Facebook? They, they had no basic understanding of the technology. I think they've caught up some since then, and certainly they're much more on top of AI than they were on social media and some of the internet protocols back in the day. But do you believe that Congress and our policymakers, including across the states, our governors, our presidential candidates, understand the magnitude of this problem and are ready to address it? Well, if they do understand the magnitude of it, they're not demonstrating that. We, we're in the midst of a national election. This issue is not front and center. There is no more important issue. So uh, they may understand it, but they're share not sharing their perspective on this. And I think it's time that they do share their perspective on this because there's nothing more important to American citizens than hearing our presidential candidates' viewpoint on this and what they're gonna do about it. Everything that we want to achieve. I was at, I was at the UN yesterday. Mm -hmm. The UN has an agenda of what they, they want to set out to achieve globally. The message to us was basically, and the reason we were invited in to talk to them, was that they cannot achieve a single one of their agenda items because of the internet technology and social media in particular. It's That's preventing them to achieve any of their objectives. They're exhausted. They're using all of their resources to do what? Mitigate? Mitigate harms? Uh, minimize damage, and they're not even keeping up with that. And this is because they're battling all the misinformation out there, because the technology is impenetrable. There must be a variety of reasons. E e exactly, but let's just take one. You know, climate change is a very, very, uh, is a top priority of, uh, of the UN. How do you address climate change if we can't agree on the facts, on whether there, whether there is an issue or not? And it's not really tongue in cheek. I think it's actually would be the case. If, if, if we had the technology we have now operating the way it does now, which is algorithmically dri driven to polarize us and to, and to amplify extremes and keep us in that state of disagreement, if we had just discovered that today that the earth was round, not flat, I think we'd be in an endless debate about whether it's flat or round because you'd have people who their whole life we're told that it was flat up until now, that would believe it's flat. And they would have deep fake videos, quote, proving, end quote, that it's flat. And then you'd have people who had made this massive discovery that the earth was round with real proof <laughs> that the earth was round yeah. presenting it. And they would say to the other half, it's round. Look, this is wonderful news. We can now innovate and do things we didn't, we couldn't do before when we thought the earth was flat. And the other side would be saying, you're, you're wrong. It's flat. I have proof. Look at my proof. And your video is fake. Yeah. And your video is fake. And your articles are fake. Because why? The algorithm is going to feed me as a flat earther videos and articles and information f that proves I'm right. And if you're a round earther, you're gonna have videos and articles and news feeds and everything to prove you're right. We can't all be 100% right all the time. But the beautiful thing about prior to this dis and misinformation age was that we actually had respected institutions and people that we trusted who would actually advance knowledge 
advanced truth, right? Advanced science for the good of humanity. Now we're stuck. We're stuck because we don't know what is truth. We don't know what is good. We don't know what is right. And that's the beginning of the end for, for civilization as we've known it. And I tell my, my, my business friends, because I'm a capitalist and I, I believe in business, that if we lose democracy, we lose capitalism. Show me one example of a thriving capitalistic marketplace without a thriving democracy. So this is very, very, these are very, very important set of issues. And, and I think it's past time for us to confront them in a very honest way and real way and address them. Because if we do, we can actually repurpose, reset this internet technology to solve problems at scale, to streamline our government, to save taxpayer money and to unlock and unleash unprecedented economic value for individuals who are on the uh, on the outside looking in right now. I want to ask you about TikTok because I know you're looking at, you know, social media's impact, but you've made it pretty clear that you want to offer to buy TikTok and make it an American company. That's a pretty fascinating discussion in and of itself. You know, here in Washington, we've got policymakers and people in and around government not using TikTok. CSIS is not on TikTok because of national security reasons. Why do you want to buy TikTok and, and what do you think the result of that would be? Two things. I'm obviously very, very concerned about this set of issues and in returning agency to individuals and the freedom and the liberty and the and the choice and autonomy that goes with that. And I think in this day and age, our data, we shouldn't be even calling it data anymore. It's our personhood. It's everything about us. And we should control, we should, again, control ourselves, our personhood. And as concerned as I've been about this issue, day before yesterday, I actually received the briefing that some of our uh, electeds had, re had received on TikTok. I didn't think I could be more concerned. Mm. And I was alarmed at what mm -hmm. I saw. It is the most powerful propaganda tool ever created. And it is, it is feeding information to a huge segment of our population as, and it's presenting the information as if it's actually the news, if it's actually the facts. When it's, what it is, is information that the Chinese Communist Party wants amplified to those people. And so that is not healthy for democracy because the Chinese Communist Party is not amplifying things that are good for America or good for democracy or good for stability in this, in this country. It, has anybody noticed how more volatile this country is and our politics is since internet technology has been uh, colonized and how it's now this surveillance-based autocratic centralized technology that exploits and preys on people, it, it creates volatility and we need to address it. So back to your question about TikTok. We've created technology, open source technology. We now have nearly a million people on this new evolved next generation internet where they own and control their identity and their data. So we have a proof of concept. We know the tech works, but a community of, of, of a million is not gonna compete against hundreds of millions. So greenlit this project in December of 19, working on it for the almost five years, wrote the book that came out recently, all before this TikTok divestment, which I think is a fantastic opportunity to actually acquire what the Chinese government uh, will either have to shut down or divest. We hope they divest it. We'd like to see TikTok continue. The 170 million users would like to see it continue, but we'd like to see it continue, continue built on a different architecture, not a top-down, algorithmically driven, exploitive platform, but one where the 170 million people own and control their data. They permission its use. They even own a piece of the platform. When we get 170 million people to move to this next generation internet, we have catalyzed an alternative to the one we have. And then we can let people decide, do they wanna continue with the internet we have 
where they're targeted nonstop, where they're preyed upon, where they get no value for their data, and they're losing control of their lives. And certainly, as a parent of seven, I know what the internet has done in terms of the ability to be a parent and protect your children, and it's not good. For sure. And, and or do you want to be on an internet where you own you, you permission you receive your, your data, uh, you can rescind that permission, you're in control, you have agency again, and we have an internet that actually embraces the core ideals and values and principles of a democratic form of government. Andrew, in closing, I'll just tell you that it, it for me, and I could be wrong, but I feel I've studied the issue, uh, I've lived with the issue, and I've talked to a lot of people, a heck of a lot smarter than me. How? Tell me how a political order like democracy based on a certain set of human values and rights can coexist with technology that turns out is more powerful and less fragile than our political order. And it's based on a centralized autocratic surveillance. And I, I, if I asked you to describe democracy, I bet you a nickel you wouldn't say centralized autocratic surveillance based. No way. And so one of the other is gonna give our political order will bend to become more autocratic and centralized, or we've got to get our technology to become more democratized and decentralized and embrace the values of democracy. This is not a tech, Project Liberty is not a tech project. This is a social project. This is a political project. This is about the future of this country. And it just so happens that the current usage of internet technology is having a disproportionate impact and is unfortunately destroying really everything we love. And it's time that we address it. Frank, thank you so much for this fascinating discussion today. Um, I hope you'll come back as this project moves forward and we can talk about this again because our listeners know this is one of these issues that I could talk about, you know, till the cows come home. So thank you so much for this opportunity. Yeah, well, thanks for having me and look forward to continuing the conversation. If you enjoyed this podcast, check out our larger suite of CSIS podcasts from Into Africa, The Asia Chessboard, China Power, AIDS 2020, The Trade Guys, Smart Women, Smart Power, and more. You can listen to them all on major streaming platforms like iTunes and Spotify. Visit csis.org slash podcasts to see our full catalog 